with the stickies. Um, Celeste is asking if it's being recorded. I think David is recording it. Is that right, David? I am. Okay. Thanks Great. for the reminder, Celeste. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump over to another part of the screen. I'm going to try to pull you all with me. So there is a, oh my, it's got very big. I'm going to try to shrink this down really quickly. There we go. That'll be better. Okay. Because we, there's a certain amount of screen real estate we can all afford. Um, so the article I asked everyone to read <clears throat> is the original editorial to um, the new Humanistic Management Journal. The Humanistic Management Journal was launched by the International Humanistic Management Association. David is one of the editors. Uh, Michael Person, who often joins us, is another editor. And he, wrote the, he wrote the editorial we've read. It was short, and one of the things it quotes right off the bat is this 2005 statement, the Humanistic Management Manifesto. And I, I trust that you've all read it, but you may be um, also looking at it now. One of the things I thought I'd pull out is, how, what does this say to research? Because we are all looking at this issue from a lens of research. A lot of humanistic management actually started with a lens of practice. So the old humanistic management network that posted this in the first place had a huge emphasis on practice. You'll see some statements in here that emphasize practice, but it has implications for research too. So as we read this statement, and maybe we can try the sticky notes again, what are some keywords that jump out to you with respect to um, research? And there's no right or wrong answers here. I'm gonna add a few as well. This is just getting going. And as you can see, um, we'll take that into questions as well. So feel free to speak up um, and feel free to post it um, you know, without saying anything, just on our little canvas here. But, uh, you know, how does manifesto relate to things like research? So to model that, I'm going to say um, one of the things that I noted in the second paragraph is decision making is a focus of humanistic management. And that's also a focus of a lot of management literature that I've looked at or, or noted. So that's a keyword that jumps out to me with uh, research implications. We could look at decision making in this context, right? Any other spoken or um, neuralized responses to that? We don't want to get so excited about the tool that we stop interacting with each other as humans. I, I'm trying to post a sticky note, like a little circle one, and I can't seem to make it do it. I'm not sure how. Really? Is anybody else having trouble making a sticky? So over here on the right, if you click on um, the uh, little, it looks like a sticky icon, you get these uh, toolbars and you can just drag it on, I think. No, nobody else seems to be able to do that. Why? Oh, do I, you know why? Because, um, because I, I see, I have different, so to use the tool, you have to be, at least I have to be in my browser, whereas I was looking at the Zoom window. Oh, shoot. Yes, no, you need to actually use your browser. <laughs> All right, got it now. <laughs> no to everyone else. I see a lot of other cursors flying around, so that's, that's great. Um, here's somebody else who's got their, their card going on the side. That's great. Um, human freedom. Excellent. Yeah, absolutely a research question. Um, good job. Anybody want to start thinking about how you might ask a research question related to this? It doesn't need to be your own research question, right? Um, but how does the how does the focus of 
this manifesto potentially uh, spark questions that are questions we could research within sort of the paradigm our programs are encouraging us to think about research. Yeah, go ahead. Please, Anya. Um, so I was uh, thinking, would we need a shift in paradigm? So one of the very basic, I'm sure it's very basic, research questions would be uh, dignity uh, elsewhere in the article has been defined as something that is above and beyond price or value. Um, one of the things we try and do in research is to you know, uh, apply some kind of a measure. And we are essentially saying that dignity does not have a measure. So that paradox, um, how could we resolve it? Or how could we, I don't know if it's the right way to put it, but operationalize dignity uh, or make sure that it is kind of being, you know, included in the uh, research that we're doing. That's one thing that comes to mind. Fantastic. Can I just pull over here and say operationalize dignity as a question? Maybe I'll just say how you said, how it's can we, question. yeah, well, well asked. Does anybody have any either further complicating questions or, or answers to Ani's question? Yeah, I'd, I'd like, um, I'd like to add a little bit to that, which would be, um, potentially related, and I'll, I'll throw this up there, um, what assumptions um, does all research make about humanity? All right, because when, you, when you're researching in the, we, people call social sciences the human sciences sometimes. And I, I, that label appeals to me, actually. Um, but it means if you're studying people, it's totally different than studying, say, atoms, where atoms are following fixed universal laws. Human beings actually think um, uh, reflexively about what they're doing, including uh, scientists who study human beings. And so you can change the meaning of what people are doing just by studying them or by suggesting a different theory for what's going on. And that can have important effects. Uh, one of the, well, yeah, let's, let's keep this uh, going. Um, oh, we've got some other good ones going on here. I see down in this green one, human freedom, how is it determined? What are the boundaries? Well said. If uh, I, I probably, one of my problems is across my screen here, I can only see five of you uh, because I'm sharing my screen. So, don't, uh, don't wait to put your hand up, just break in and say something because that will get us all, all going a little bit better. So if you've, if you've put one of these uh, tags up there, would you just go ahead and tell us what you're thinking about, the, about your note? I'll just pipe up and say, I, I, I wrote the, the little green circle that says, you know, how, what are the boundaries on human freedom? Um, oh, great. And, but I, you know, that to me, at least on the surface, I think veers back into that normative um, area. And I'm not sure exactly how I might be researching that, you know, in a more traditional way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So another another dimension that's worth kind of oh go ahead go ahead Celeste what I, I was just going to say that um, that uh, actually I just lost my thought never mind go ahead <laughs> I have to just be more patient that's one of my issues I'm working on it <laughs> um, what I was going to say is uh, the the dichotomies that we're facing in these questions also come up so normative um, versus, can we call it descriptive? Um, whatever we mean by the opposite of normative, um, inductive perhaps. You know, these, are, these are tensions that we find and I think we need to try to hold those tensions um, and, and dig into them for maybe this hour. So yeah. If you're asking about human freedom, 
is that a normative question or is that a um, descriptive? Is that, can you, can you assess that somehow um, scientifically? Any thoughts on this? What are ways people have tried to deal with human freedom from a more scientific perspective? So I, I my my understanding is that this is is something that is more often uh, discussed in political science, in um, philosophy. Uh, Fields outside of management, <laughs> um, except except possibly where it intersects with um, you know business ethics. Mm. So, okay. And some of the measurements are tied to um, human rights. So if we can measure whether or not people think their human rights in the different forms are actually being uh, respected, then we can get a little closer to dignity. Hmm. Sure. So you could even kind of try to assess something like freedom as a, what is freedom? What freedom is there in this situation? Or how do people, do people think they're free in this situation? Right. Not bad. Any other thoughts? I'm going to start calling on people. Um, so I was just thinking, um, again, I've been reading up on institutional theory recently, and uh, one of the things that the theory talks about is how institutions define uh, freedoms of the actors, right? The, like, the freedom is essentially embedded in the structure of the institution. So another question could be um, what the institution of, you know, the the board, the corporate board, um, or society as a whole, the various institutions in which we are embedded, how they are interacting with each other, and is the idea of human freedom being uh, modified, or is it eventually modifying the idea of the board? Uh, because the questions we are asking um, uh, talk about a changing role for the boards also. Uh, so that's just a thought that I had. That's a great thought. Ani, thank you. And we, we actually talked a little bit about institution theory in our last call. So that's a really yeah, I missed that great, one. Yes, I read that though, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Right. So we it's um <laughs> a little bit of a bridge, but you're right. Institution theory says that once people are are sort of settled in an institutionalized environment, that actually their whole concept of freedom is then pre-rational, it's taken for granted. And hmm. so what they are, what they think of as their freedom to do and don't do is, is almost all defined for them. So mm -hmm. in an interesting way, institution theory's concept of freedom is being highlighted by this, um, by this manifesto. And I wonder, mm -hmm. I wonder, Celeste, if that's part of what's also triggering your sort of uh, normative normativity detector mm -hmm. is would we then go criticize institution theory because of this understanding of freedom versus a more autonomous understanding of individuals? You know, I, I was actually just sitting here thinking about this because I'm working on a paper right now um, about uh, one organization that's trying to shape the, the, the moral foundation of a field, of a new field that doesn't necessarily have norms yet. Um, and so, uh, and they're taking a position that is very counter to what would be traditional in, in or what we would normally think of as a, a freedom or right. Um, and in fact, they are flipping it around and saying, no, it is a human right to, in this case, they're talking about sharing genetic data and, and saying, no, we have a right to do this and we should be free to do this. When in fact, that could infringe on the freedoms of others. Um, but, and so I'm, I'm sitting here saying, well, so how do we, how do we gauge what, you know, what is, what 
whose freedoms, you know, end where and, and mm -hmm. what are the boundaries of, and again, this gets to like an individual versus collective um, question. Uh, and, but I'm not sure how what I'm working on necessarily uh, I, I, I think I feel a little confused as to how to take these questions that I'm, I'm grappling with and look at them through this lens and say, how do I apply these ideas, um, uh, the humanistic ideas, to a more uh, traditional, you know, what you said, normal science <laughs> type. Yeah. Uh, where I'm supposed to just be looking at, oh, isn't this interesting what they're doing? And not necessarily asking, well, is this, sh you know, should organizations be doing these things? Um, and, uh, you know, and perhaps, perhaps maybe I bring in the humanistic perspective in the discussion, you know, at the mm -hmm. end of the paper, um, where where I've explored, you know, this this case of an organization who's doing this, that, and the other, and here are the mechanisms of by which they're trying to influence a field, and then in the discussion, I bring up the the humanistic uh, uh, notions of, you know, should should they be doing these things? I, you know, maybe that's one way to incorporate. Uh, you know, some of these ideas. Totally. Yeah. Other thoughts on that? I mean, one, one suggestion I have might be to take a step back and, and uh, I know there was like no time I sent these things out on Friday. I'm really sorry about that. But I did attach a kind of, you know, overachiever reading and um, one of those articles by Dominic Mele talks about the history of humanistic management and he contrasts in, you know, this is a small part of his paper, but he contrasts the human relations school. And so, you know, we, we've um, probably talked about that in our programs a little bit, uh, the original studies of the um, um, electricity plant and things like that. And the the idea that you need to treat your employees well, and the and the contrast between that perspective and the old, what was originally called scientific management, right, which was Taylor, Frederick Winslow Taylor, who said, well, let's go measure people lifting up widgets and putting them down and twisting and turning and how long do they take and try and increase the output of the factory. And Mele's contrast there was to say the human relations school has a theoretical construct that uh, ascribes dignity and well-being to human beings, it, it still believes that they're contributing to success or failure of their, their work organization. But Frederick Winslow Taylor's theory, this is Mele's um, you know, claim, Frederick Winslow Taylor merely views the employees in the factory as a means of production. And you, you, know, you could replace them with machines and there's no difference. There's no change in the, the moral um, quality of business. And so I think the humanistic management perspective in this contrast is almost in the research design. Um, what do you pay attention to? What do you think is important when you are collecting data, when you're thinking about these things? Because you can still study productivity in both cases, right? So that was, that's one thought. Um, let's, let's make sure um, we've heard from everybody. I, I know not all of you I can see, so I don't know if you're with us or not, but I can see Victoria. And Victoria, I wonder if you found any um, keywords or questions to put on the mural. Yeah, I'll do the last sticker at the moment. Um, I've been following it. I find it like from the freedom aspect quite interesting, like as uh, Dirk's has done a lot of research in that field. 
Um, dignity de definitely is uh, a very, very interesting concept. I don't know, from the practical field, um, I would, I don't know, I, I, I kind of think of kind of like what measurements or like how one can establish a structure of understanding different uh, concepts of dignity. So like um, using the example of like a company being based in Germany or the US expanding to China and they might not grasp their like whatever they associate with, with dignity or even like um, one might not even have like the same word like a word might have you know like different compounds and they overlap in some ways and um differ in other ways so um so far i haven't read about a method of how to approach this um differences or like how to incorporate them or like how to um yeah just kind of like what kind of methodologies to use to kind of like establish an understanding to actually um evolve together in the sense of like you know improving scientifically um values or like um yeah incorporating incorporating values in in one's uh, business activities yeah i think those are great questions victoria thank you for that um yeah has anyone thought of a method that might work to study human freedom or dignity in a work environment or even in two like um, a western country and china could you could you somehow investigate that i would think that at the individual level so if you're a, if you're more of a micro researcher um, I think there are probably some established uh, methods of looking at uh, how, you know, whether people feel, feel autonomy or satisfaction or fulfillment or I, at the individual level, that's, that seems pretty, the methods are pretty well established and, um, and granted I'm not a micro researcher so I don't know if there are if there are well-established and validated constructs that to, to measure those specific values, but um, I'm not I'm not sure how we would look at how we would you know study these things on a, a organization. Level. Okay, so I've added up on our row of tensions across the top, micro versus macro. I think that's a great um, question is maybe you could. So the research method that comes to my mind, um, both from Celeste and Victoria's comment is phenomenology, um, basically trying to get into the lived experience of individual people. Um, you know, that's a very kind of, um, intensive you do it's not just one interview you do many many interviews and you try to really say looking out from this person's eyes or maybe 10 people's eyes what's it like to be in your environment you could ask questions about human autonomy or freedom you could do comparative work in different places you're going to be bound a little Professionalized um, ideas of freedom. Oh, somebody's jumping in. What What was the comment there? I think it was me. I'm sorry. Like the the my, somehow like the the connection isn't the be best one. So I hope I'm not interrupting. Not at all. Join in. Okay. Um, I don't know. Two things come into mind. The one thing which was mentioned by Dirk Smyer, which was like the challenge to um the approach of humanistic management by people who are saying just kind of like, you can't really come up with a norm by like having so many different cultural contexts. So like, you do have this kind of like the, the discussion about like the rel relativity of things. So I don't, I don't want to put it in an absolute, but I think that like the cultural context is something very um, profound and has to be um, acknowledged and, and um, 
thought of because like for example in a western cultural context you can approach somebody and pose very straightforward questions in other contexts you you may not be able to do so at all like um people will not tell you immediately like what kind of difficulties they felt at certain situations um so i don't know it's it's wonderful putting the the human into the center but it's still um I, I don't know, I, I feel like one should scientifically, scientifically one should also start that people coming from Western University are already like kind of accustomed to different perspectives. So to scientists who have learned like and never engaged with Western philosophies or Western uh, theories is to establish like a kind of common understanding and not like a hierarchy between values or I don't know. Mm hmm. That's great. Um, by the way, I'm probably not as tuned into the chat as some of you are. I see that there's been some good discussion here. Um, anyone, uh, Jintz or Sunitha, if you're able, um, feel free to join in on audio. And also, um, maybe David, can I ask you to make sure that you're um, the voice for getting those chat comments into our, our broader conversation. I know we have a few people who join from libraries from time to time. Yes, yeah, Sunitha, are you able to uh, ask your question on freedom? Okay, she can't um, Yeah. It out loud. So she's wondering when we think of the word freedom, if it should be pegged against the question question does the freedom contribute to the well-being and flourishing and dignity of humanity because humanity is the ultimate end for humanistic management and that that's a good point uh, dignity is sort of the root behind promoting well-being and human flourishing so if we can use that as sort of the vehicle the idea from a lot of michael pearson's work is that uh, if we promote dignity among individuals and organization then the likelihood that their well-being and human flourishing will be realized is much higher. So should we focus on freedom as sort of a proxy for dignity? Is, is, that, um, is that where you're going with this, Sunitha? You can write in the chat. Hmm. That's a great idea. Also, I um, oh, I had a great thought to share, but it's gone. It'll come back. Um, we'll while see we, we, yeah, we'll see. please please continue your thoughts in the in the chat. Yeah, I think it's an important question to get to. What what do we do with with freedom here, and is freedom enough to actually achieve? well-being and flourishing i would i would argue probably not oh okay that's what i was thinking is there is some work trying to create a theoretical model for measuring a capabilities perspective on human freedom within an organization and so you know, attempt to building on Nussbaum and Sen's capabilities approach to say, if we go into a business, um, we could measure, so that's the key where we pulled out a peer measure, um, Victoria brought that up. Um, oh, sorry, Vi, um, I hope that you can rejoin us next time. Vi has to leave. Um, but, so that's an attempt to build a theoretical framework for measurement that could then be applied scientifically later on. So maybe one of the issues here is that there's less of a theoretical framework developed from a humanistic perspective because there has been, it's not been a focus in the recent decades of management scholarship. But that doesn't necessarily mean it's normative versus descriptive. I think you could build a descriptive theory. Um, I don't want to cut anybody off. But I do have another another screen to look at. 
So any final thoughts before we leave the manifesto? This has been a great conversation here. Yeah, I would, I would even argue that uh, Frederick Taylor thought that uh, the employees that you know he was managing essentially as extensions of machines for the benefit of management back in the early part of the last century uh, did feel that the employees had some level of freedom because uh, they had the ability to go to the manager and, and say, hey, I think this process would work better if we did this. And the scientific management principles allowed for that. So that is a form of freedom, but that's not the kind of freedom that uh, humanistic management is really talking about. And it's certainly not enough to achieve uh, respect and dignity, I don't think. Really hopeful. Thanks, David. Um, so I'm gonna pull you all to a new view. So you'll, you'll be able to see both in the Zoom window, but then I'm gonna make you all follow me in your browsers. Um, there. So you should be able to see, and we talked a little bit about the tension between normative and descriptive. Celeste brought that up. We haven't touched on theoretical or empirical too much. Uh, we talked about micro and macro. Uh, there's a lot of tensions in our field or a lot of kind of um, spectrums. So we could have, I could have drawn this grid with a lot of different quantitative, qualitative. However, <laughs> our questions about normativity especially. So I think that one being the left right axis is key. And I was going to use this grid to talk about each of the articles that Michael um, introduces in his editorial. But I think a better way to do this, because Celeste, you've brought up your research several times. I wonder, Celeste, if you'd be willing to describe to us briefly, you know, I get the impression you're working in a macro context. What are you looking at? And then all of us, let's drag um, a dot. This is, I, I didn't put this on here thinking of Celeste, but drag a dot onto the quadrant that you think it sounds like Celeste's working in based on her description. Are you game for that, Celeste? A little vulnerable. <laughs> Oh, we can't hear you. Can't hear you. Yeah, I'm not getting any audio. Is anybody else here, Celeste? Yeah, no. That's weird. Um, you're not muted in Zoom. I wonder if your PC is potentially muted. It was working just a minute ago. Hmm. Not getting it. Okay. Well, <laughs> you don't have like something plugged into you. I think uh, Anu is suggesting your headphones. You know, might might use headphones. It may be my internet. Um, ah, no, I can hear you now. Oh, gotcha. I can hear you now. Oh, okay. It, yeah. it, so I'm in a room that is at the opposite end of the house from my Wi-Fi router. So it may be that that my internet is wobbly and I'm not always transmitting or receiving everything. So um, I I can if if I drop out, just somebody like raise your hand in the window or something so I can see. <laughs> um, but I, in thinking about this so what what I'm researching right now is the evolution of a new field um, this field of genomic medicine and I uh, and just trying to to look at how the actions of different organizations and how they're trying to shape the evolution of this field um, and uh, so you've got one organization that is advocating for um, sharing data broadly uh, across countries, across organizations. They, they claim that it will help us cure disease on a global scale. So um, then, uh, then I'm, I'm looking at, okay, and so specifically, I'm looking at what are the mechanisms that they are using to, to advance their, their perspective. 
and, and use that to create the foundational norms for this new field, which actually are um, in, you know, are, are in opposition to social norm, our, our current social norm, almost globally around the world, is that is for privacy, that privacy is our right, not open sharing. And that, um, and so they're saying, you know, privacy is, is really much less important than sharing. Um, and so they're trying to establish these field norms um, by, uh, by creating technical standards, by um, establishing, using discourse to, to normalize um, uh, a lot of, you know, a lot of these ideas through scientific journals, et cetera, et cetera. So um, that said, um, I'm, I'm, this, is, I'm, this is obviously very much an, an, an empirical- Oh, don't say, don't say, don't say. Okay. Don't, don't tell us your answer. <laughs> So everyone having listened to Celeste's research design, right, and knowing that these are continuums or tensions rather than yes or no, right, do we think it's primarily theoretical, primarily empirical, primarily normative, primarily descriptive, um, drag a sticky on to where you think what she's talked about probably goes. You can put your own sticky on Celeste, they're anonymous, so we won't know it's you. <laughs> and I think a helpful um, contrast, and, and Victoria will be able to do this, if not, if not everybody else, is the second article I sent out from Klaus Dirksmeier is attempting to define humanistic management from a philosophical perspective. All right, so it's the second piece in that original volume of um, humanistic management journal. And he's saying, this is what humanistic management is. So um, if you wanna either think about it or go ahead and do it yourself, think about where would you put a circle of maybe a different color for Klaus's article on defining humanistic management philosophically versus what we've just done or are doing for Celeste's article. So yeah, I would, I guess I'll use pink for Celeste. That's probably where I'd put yours. And I think, I put Dirk Smyer way up there. Yeah. Um, but I like how we've separated the contribution and the research because of course you're making a theoretical contribution, right? Of course. But it's not an AMR piece. It's not it's not only theory, at least not yet. Um, oh yeah, no, this is definitely <laughs> not AMR. <laughs> yeah, it's so another way of saying this is it phenomena based. Is it phenomena driven? Right? You're you're getting out there and you're you're engaged in the phenomena. So yeah, um, this is the tension we were trying to come here to talk about today. And finally, uh, probably time to do it. One of the exercises I thought we might try to do with this grid is to see of the seven or eight articles Michael introduces in his piece, do we think that some of those articles fit in different quadrants here? Because they're all in HMJ, so they're all sort of by fiat humanistic. But on those last two pages of his article, is he introducing articles that based on that little paragraph, you know, we haven't had time to go read the whole issue. Are there, are there pieces that may fit in you know, maybe some of the boxes that Celeste research fits in? And if so, why do we think that's the case? Maybe, maybe we can discuss it 
um, rather than trying to, to do a lot of little docs. But you know, do we think that there are articles in HMJ that are phenomena driven, describe um, mechanisms that are at work out in the real world? You're nodding, Ani. What do you think? Not normally, yeah. I'm just taking in the question and trying to see uh, what might fit where. Ah, okay. It's a good question. You're affirming my <laughs> question. I thought it was a good question. I, I thought about it for a while. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What do you think, David? I, I don't see too much of it there. Um, so I, I don't know, is the focus of this question more on the, the proper outlet for this kind of phenomenon-based research? Let me pull up, because I, I felt like there was a few that were at least more in there. So where's, oh, I'm on the wrong article. Yeah, you get to see all of mine now. It just has to be, uh, in talking to um, Tima Bonsall last month, who's associate editor at AMR, it really just has to be something that's in the conversation. So if the topic in AMR or AMJ for that matter has, uh, has been discussed before, then you have a greater likelihood, even if it's phenomenal, uh, phenomenon based, it's just, they're more reluctant to take something that's completely new unless there's a special issue on it. Mm -hmm. So the one I had in mind now that I remember when I formed this was um, Donna Hicks. So she's working with an airline and she's working with conflict in Colombia and Northern Ireland, right? And um, you know, I haven't gone and read the article but my sense is she doesn't come into Northern Ireland and say, right, here is how you guys need to <laughs> um, include human dignity in the way you do stuff here. Um, I'm guessing that she does a lot of listening and observing how people themselves are relating to those ideas. So that was, that was um, one that I thought might go in kind of the descriptive side. I don't know for sure. And, and David, you probably edited these, so you know too much. <laughs> no, certainly not. But uh, no, that, that's a very good example, actually. And Donna actually uh, worked uh, pretty closely with Michael. Ah, okay. Okay. Yeah. Any others people are observing? Certainly, um, Sandra up here has um, interviewed 28 people. Um, so that's kind of empirical, right? But then she's talking about uh, reforming business education. So that's kind of normative. Right. So I, I probably would put that one in the bottom left quadrant on our on our little guy. It's appropriate. Yeah. yeah, both of these are appear to be qualitative research. I don't see a lot of quantitative research. Celeste, are you doing quantitative or qualitative methods? <laughs> Sorry. Still can't hear you. <laughs> This takes a long time for the sound to make it from her room to the other end of the house where the router is. Yeah, we got no sound. That's all right, Celeste, sorry. Thank you, you're qualitative. That's what I thought. Um, you know, so an another research method I thought of that seems very humanistic is, is Anne Langley's process research. And I know she's presented in our, in our forums, right? So she gets in there she says, people are doing something, but we haven't necessarily worked out what leads to what leads to what leads to what, and what does it all mean to them? So that's bringing the people in very much. And, and maybe a framework you choose to use, Celeste, sounds like you're in a really interesting, you know, stage of ferment right now, and you're going to have to collect data and come out with 
an approach, but you may have a process model at the end, right? So that could be very humanistic, potentially. I'm wondering if that could be a subject of a future PhD reading group too. Process research? Yeah. Because mm. that would be very uh, useful to this group and to humanistic management researchers anywhere. Mm. Makes sense. To it me. would take a lot of pre-reading on behalf of everyone, I think, including myself. True, true. Well, maybe we get uh, Anne to come and she can. Yeah. She can do all the hard work and we'll, sure. we'll, do, we'll do a little bit of the pre-reading. Um, we're getting, we always want to say the last few minutes for feedback. One of the things I had hoped we would discuss a little bit is the distinction between uh, Homo economicus and uh, some of the other models of the human being. One of the ones that Dominic, may, uh, was it Klaus or Dominic? Anyway, the two articles I sent mentions homo integralis, so the whole person. And that, that shows up here in Michael's introduction as well, treating the human as a whole being rather than um, falsely reducing. And I was realizing we have a lot of, it, criticizing homo economicus is popular now uh, in, in behavioral yeah. studies. But the, if you've read, say, Kahneman's Thinking Fast and Slow, the criticism is that people don't make economical, rational decisions. People are irrational. And that's not the point of humanistic management. So it's, it's almost an orthogonal criticism, which says it's not that people are irrational or don't make economic decisions. It's that people have a lot more going on in their values and in their in the meaning they draw out of their life and their social behavior that theories especially macro level theories boiling people down to kind of uh, economic or means ends self-interested behavior are just fundamentally missing what people do and i think that can be a, quant a quantitative person needs to think about that issue when they are designing their research or working with their theory, right? Ah, but that's provoked Celeste. Great. Going back to the question of what we can measure. That's provocative. Anybody want to respond to Celeste? She says, we study the things we can measure. It's easier that way, right? <laughs> That's I mean, where my initial question was uh, coming from uh, yeah. about how we can operationalize or try and measure dignity because I think in research so far it's very, it, like, yeah, as David said, it's just easy you know, to study what we can measure and there's so much of it. Um, so it's very hard to get to things that um, cannot be measured as if you're, or even defined as you're saying and I'm completely with you. Uh, you know, uh, things like dignity are extremely, uh, they're experienced. Um, and we had this debate at some point, for example, if, if an oppressed person is not feeling oppressed, then is he truly oppressed, you know? And in societies like ours, um, let's say the emerging economies, the cultural and social structures, going to Victoria's point, are such that people have, uh, you know, a meaning to their place in the social structure and they don't see it as not being dignified. A lot of people do dirty work, you know what uh, uh, Jens was saying earlier. Um, one of my seniors is doing a thesis on uh, uh, how people cope with the stigma of dirty work. Uh, but there are all these complications. I don't know if people realize that there is not uh, enough dignity in what they are doing. So who is defining um, you know, dignity or what it should be for uh, a, a group of people? Um, there are all these complications, so I think which is why it's just easier to study things that we can measure. Hmm. I mean, I wonder if with the right lens, you could take back some of the data that there may be data sets out there that, that point or hint at this. So when I mm -hmm. worked at a big company, there was regularly questions, you know, survey the whole entire company um, mm -hmm. I feel comfortable raising concerns to upper management. So that goes to what David was saying. Or mm -hmm. my, my ideas are valued in this company. I 
um, enjoy working here. What are some of the other? So there are actually, it, it's hard to get some of that data because companies keep it close, mm -hmm. but there are at least surveys out there that get at how people mm. are, are, do they feel that dignity is accorded to them in mm -hmm. their work environment? Because companies, mm. companies know that when those scores go down, things mm. are bad. Right. Mm. So that might, that might be another dimension to look at for operationalizing. It could be improved on. Mm. Right. Okay. We're at time. Um, I'd love it if Celeste would give a final typing sentence or, or word, and since this is her question, drawing, drawing the um, session to a close. And then also using Mural, um, I don't care where you do it. If you guys would leave um, a thought about whether you like this tool and whether you thought it was useful for our discussion or, or uh, maybe a distraction. Good. And Celeste, I think, is working on her. We can't hear you, sadly. Really a shame. Can't hear you now. What a funny thing. Yeah, my impressions of the tool were very positive, and now I'm seeing a new thinks it was good as well. If any of you had a problem with it, uh, please let us know. But I think this was uh, a good way to visualize our discussion. I thank Tyson for coming up with this and Celeste. For sure. Let me just do a quick plug, if you wouldn't mind. Um, next Monday, the third, Anu is actually going to be presenting her research to our PhD network at noon right. Eastern time, the normal uh, first Monday of the month. So uh, I invite you all to come. I'll be sending out reminder invitations through Eventbrite. But please RSVP so we know um, how many to plan for. Great. All right. I think Celeste is, is typing, and so that will come right at the end. But first of all, uh, thank you, Jens and Sunitha, for joining us. And we'd love to hear from you as well. Um, you know, how included you felt, how well you thought it worked given the visual tool. And then um, Anu, Victoria, Celeste, David. And, and this, this was very important for our future meetings too. So I'm glad Celeste reminded me to record this. So this will be posted on our website and we can build on this discussion so you can refer back to it. All right. Okay. Well, thank you. Oh, I, could hear, I heard you say that, Celeste. That's so funny. Uh, maybe not. <laughs> it just comes and goes. All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a All great right, day. Thank you very much. Oh, yes. David, do you want to stay on for five minutes or do you have to drive? I will. Uh, I, I can stay on here for a few minutes. Sure. Okay. Thank you all. Bye, everyone. Thank you, everyone. See you Bye -bye. on the third on you. Bye bye. Thanks, Victoria. Bye. <laughs> Celeste, feel free to stay as well if you'd like to do debrief. I don't know how we're going to fix your audio. Um, it seems like we can't hear you right now. I can see you. I can see your video. It's not, it's not your internet. Your internet is working perfectly. Yeah, you have but, very clear um, video. Yeah. Well, I do have, a, I do have another call. I just, I scheduled so many things for Memorial Day. I just completely forgot it was Memorial Day. So, um, but I don't know, Tyson. I thought, okay. uh, I thought that went pretty well. Yeah, me too. Um, yeah, we don't have to. We don't have to take long. I, I, um, if you like the tool, uh, one thing I thought is it's paid. It's a paid tool, so I don't know if Duquesne would consider um, the license. Um, I can yeah, how much is it? it? I think it's about. Um, it's like a hundred, hundred fifty for a year, or we could do a monthly. I think we can do that. That'd be really cool. Yeah, um, maybe we can. Um, so you have, are you using as a guest or is this something that Oxford provides for you? 
So I signed up for the free trial for today. Okay. So I'm, I'm on a 30 day free trial and I was able to, so what I was able to do is create um, a canvas in the first place and then it gives a share and you can then share with uh, an, an anonymous share and then everybody else can um, use it, you know, as without having to log in. And okay. that seems pretty powerful. Um, yeah, no, I think we can, uh, we can find that for sure. Um, one, one thing for me is um, I really want to make sure that the students feel they have the opportunity to speak. And so I was reluctant to say some things at certain moments, but uh, I don't know, the, the group seems to be loosening up a bit, which is good. Oh yeah. Thank you for, thank you for being mindful of that. Um, yeah, but I, uh, I think I asked you your opinion once or twice. Yeah, yeah I know. And I, oh, well, I think you could really contribute. Oh, thank you, Celeste, for your comments as well. I see your second. Yeah, I know. You're fantastic at this. And Celeste, you always have great comments. No, oh, thank you. Celeste, you were awesome as well. And um, I, I don't think we've necessarily settled the question, right? I think this is the that no, we have to drive into. But, um, you know. Well, maybe, uh, so we're going to do another one on June 10th. We should maybe think, we don't decide right now, but think on uh, how to build on this. Mm -hmm. decide, uh, you know, how we're going to um, 